So good morning, dear Rona. Nice to have you here. Hi, good morning, Bishop. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a while. It has been a while. It's indeed a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, what is it you said? Three wickets down? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing cricket. I'm doing radio. <laughs> Bishop, do not distract me. It is so hard for me not to check these updates right now. Yeah, but you know, the most important thing, for those who are not into cricket, we know that we have you here. And those who are into cricket, we know we're having a tough time because you're either doing your ears and eyes on the TV and radio or your eyes and ears on the, on the TV. We understand. But we've got serious things to happen, you know. Uh, in this world, you've got a lot of things happening at the same time. And sometimes, as I always say, it is not what's more important, it's what's more immediate. More immediate are the issues that confront us. Among them being a situation, I'm waiting for my first guest to step in. When he does, he is the Vice President of the Steel Workers Union of Trinidad and Tobago. When he does, we will be discussing that sad situation we see where uh, many, um, the, the spouse of many of the dismissed employees of Asala Metal, uh, they are in fact seeking a psychiatric help to such an extent that the minister, um, the line minister has said that in fact they are setting up some support units for these people, but I'll get into the details of that later on. One of the things that uh, my guests, and I ask you here, immediately upon hearing the statement of um, uh, Minister in the Attorney General's office, George Young, um, do his contribution in Parliament. And what he dealt with was a situation that may involve some police. It may involve some criminality. It may involve hmm, what a lot of folks would like to see, bracelets. The end of the day, what my guest said early, the first time she was here with me, she made it clear to me, let my guest come in if he's here, she made it clear to me, she said, the population must be very aware that in order to accommodate what they would like to happen, which is to see someone brought to justice, they must have patience. And I remember you making that statement. It resonated with me, as I hope it resonated with our listeners. So that is a situation we will be talking about. And Stuart Young uh, made it very clear that he is exploring legal options, and this deals specifically Constructora OAS, that's the uh, organization was taken for the extension of the Solomon Hochoy Highway. It has cost a lot of money. Original agreement was for $5.2 billion. He said so far we're looking at $8 billion is where it stands now, including a number of areas of it that are disturbing, like the advancing of 20%, 20% of, 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 of the contract money when generally... Generally, internationally, under the Federation of Consulting Engineers Agreement, it is generally 10%. Let me jump in there. Um, before we even get to the 20% and the 10%, in the exact same year, I mean, two governments mm. consecutively um, got estimates for this project, right? Mm. Both the PNM, that would, uh, who, whose term in office mm. ended in 2010, and then the People's Partnership, whose term in office started in 2010. Mm-hmm. They both had estimates in the same year. One estimate was $3.6 billion. And then the subsequent estimate, it jumps to $5.2 billion. So that's at least $2 billion more that they meant to spend on it. And we're not, that, that isn't explained. Right, that isn't explained to us at all. So we don't know why or what co- caused um, the engineer's estimate to change. Um, so that's, I think that's one of the first places to start. But the overall thing is this. You're looking at public waste, Bishop. Mm-hmm. Public waste and public waste that seems, given the mm-hmm. statement read out by um, Minister Young in Parliament mm-hmm. on Friday, mm-hmm. public waste that seems to have been facilitated by a sitting government. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, they, they, as they helped. They put the conditions in place for this waste to, to have happened or for this mismanagement to have happened. And now, in the... You know, with with these findings coming out, the minute I, I think uh, Surud Rambachan spoke and said he he doesn't know anything about this. <laughs> he said, um, I, "I am I am willing to be scrutinized." But before I get to him, there are a couple of things here that are, sure, are, are, sure. are strange. As there are lots said. of things that are strange about you know, this. You want to say, in the case of um, of some people, you would say this is just um, bad management. Mm-hmm. In other cases, you say this is just negligent. In this case, it seems to be more here because if you can take. The last working day before a general election Mm -hmm. and go against what is good advice, which is international precedent, Mm -hmm. which is to terminate a contract because there is a a company calling bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to do that. You do not do that. Instead, what you do is you waive your right Mm -hmm. 
to terminate the contract and and, and, and put the cost of all uh, of the incomplete work to the contractor. And you don't do that a day before election. Me think something smells really high. Yeah, very rotten in the state of Denmark. And, and I'm going to agree with you here. You've got a case of international best practice established and you've got... A situation, certainly what seems to have been outlined by Minister Young, of the state, the state, well, or rather, let me say the government, the sitting government, ignoring international best practice. So what you've got to ask now is why, on what grounds? And I want to make this very, 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 very clear here. This mm. alone was not used to build this highway. <laughs> this is money that comes straight out of the treasury. And that is another area that we'll explore later on because mm. generally what you do is you go to one of the international lending agencies where the, yeah. um, where, where the, uh, the interest is a lot lower. It makes a lot more sense to keep your money uh, from, your, from your government in your country while you take loan from somewhere else. But all of that. And then there's strict, there's strict procurement mm. and tendering procedures when you go <laughs> to an international <laughs> lending agency. Now you see what we've set up for you? It means when we get to this segment... This discussion with Rhoda Barrett, the voice you just hearing, university lecturer, blogger, and political commentator, along with Dr. Winford James when he comes in, we have a whole lot to talk about. We'll be talking about it. So sit down, grab which part of the breakfast you find most palatable. That part, uh, for many people, will not be palatable. That's, of course, if they occupy the government before that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> take, take, take what's in the offing that's palatable to you and uh, digest it as we continue talking. We'll get back to that subject. Our first guest this morning is the vice president, first vice president, is that correct? A second vice president of the Steel Workers Union of Trinidad and Tobago, Rajkumar Nani Singh. Am I, uh, did I get that correct? Uh, let us get his microphone up. There you go. Uh, good morning. Yes, Ram Kumar. How are Ram you? Kumar Narayan Singh. Right, Narayan Singh. Ah, your writing is just as bad as mine. <laughs> <laughs> Ram Kumar, thank you so much. You're the second vice president of the Steel Workers uh, Union of Trinidad and Tobago. It's good that you are in. I know that your president is out of the country and couldn't make it. I am happy that you denied your inclination to stay across there and watch the cricket match and eventually <laughs> come over. Uh, in, the, in other words, he said, he said, you know what he reminds me of the 12 minute rota? I think it was uh, Joseph Stalin uh, who was afraid of traveling or flying. And he said to them after they were dividing the world after the Second World War, I think you can hold up on the division until I finish with this train ride. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ram Kumar, thank you so much for coming in. Steel workers situation is a serious one. Asila Metal, um, they are, uh, they come, that's the company that terminated so many workers. Um, the workers, of course, being um, getting what is due them is at the bottom of the totem pole. That is an arrangement I know that will take a different discussion. One of the areas that I am curious about when I ask you in was, firstly, the families that are now seeking psychiatric help because this has impacted on them heavily. The minister, the line minister has said that the government will come in. They will, in fact, do support for you. I asked the question, however, how prepared was your union for this situation? One, in the sense that you cannot anticipate what a company is going to do. I understand that. Um, But when you have this kind of dismissal going on, what sort of support services were in place from the union end? Not from what the employer uh, agreed to, but from the end of the union, i.e. this kind of psychological support and any extended uh, payment to the workers. Make clear to our listeners what existed um, at the the point of this termination in the Steel Workers Union of Trinidad and Tobago for the workers. Well, good morning to everybody. Good morning to the nation. Um, As it pertains to uh, the Steel Workers Union, our service is... um, industrial relations Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and we do because of the fact that we have had experience in dealing with employees while they are on the job having um, problems as social problems um, namely probably drug abuse alcoholism um, you know this kind of um, behavioral problems as well Um, we have had experience in dealing with um, um, getting counseling etc etc but Mm -hmm. But the magnitude now is something absolutely new for us. Um, in terms of um, dealing with uh, employees, uh, we would have had the, um, the odd occasion where an employee would have financial issues or as it pertains to probably gambling mm-hmm. and, and end up in financial difficulties. But this is a whole different realm. So so being prepared, I don't think that we were in any way prepared. Even the, the small services that we would have had access to as it pertains to um, our experience in uh, ensuring workers mm. seek counseling and seek EAP, mm-hmm. right? Um, 
we were not prepared in any way to deal with it. I can easily understand you or any, any union being overwhelmed by this. I do have a question, however. Uh, well, you know, Usually when you have the fortune, even though it comes out of an unfortunate situation, you had a shot fired across the bow way back last year in December. It said to you something was coming. I know that your people inside would have seen the situation there and said, maybe this could happen. There's a possibility this could happen. And I am not here to attack you or your union. I am instead trying to understand the role of a union when you see a, a, a cyclical situation uh, repeat, uh, you know, presenting itself. How, 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 much, how much adjustment did the union do to deal with this, what I'm sure from last year seemed like an eventuality? Well, I don't take that question as a, an attack. As a matter of fact, I feel that you have a, um, a point that um, uh, in looking at the whole scenario, um, there could have been a possibility. And the union did look at that possibility. But when we, you see, in analyzing it, while you look at the possibility, you analyze, you analyze the facts that are present there. Mm-hmm. And the fact was that the company did not retrench the company enacted layoff mm-hmm. and understanding what the term layoff, what the process of layoffs means to the worker and the, to the union is that an, it is a, it is a avenue that is available to the employer for them to have a sort of a holiday where they can put their financial um, condition back in, a, in mm-hmm. an order where they can continue to employ. Mm-hmm. So the company uh, and taking a position of layoff rather than retrenchment. It's told us as the organization, as the union, that, okay, this company is interested in putting themselves together to continue to employ, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So um, the, when you look at the, uh, the level of deceit in the enacting that and now taking this position, also prior to this layoff, mm-hmm. we had we've spent almost a year and a half with this company in dialogue um, negotiating uh, possibilities and ideas to continue employment through avenues where we can t- kind of change the dynamics of the organization in terms of how we operate, how what workers do, um, doing alternative duties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we were in a in a situation where we could not have seen in in any absolute way, even the remote possibility at that point in time. You see, mm-hmm. it would have been us exploring the possibility at the company just closing down, terminating everybody, and moving on. You were there was caught- nowhere in the realm, nowhere. Okay. There was no inclination. Okay. But I want to mention now that there was a strong possibility that the government, the government would have been aware that the company would have been going in this direction. And we are aware of this now because I point to the the information that the company gave us on March the 11th, mm-hmm. they indicated that last year, December, while we were on layoff... 2015 December. 2015 December. They would have written the government, offering the government the plant for sale for... A dollar. Um, let me just let you know, first of all, um, be careful of those who are bearing uh, gifts. A doll, uh, was it a dollar plus $1.8 well, billion? One, dollars, 1. But we, yeah, billion and dollar the true debt. fact is well, about $2 billion. But let me just let our listeners know the voice you're hearing is that of uh, Ram Kumar Narayan Singh. He is the second vice president of the Steel Workers Union of Trinidad and Tobago. The other voice you hear uh, coming in, the best of the voices, is that of um, lecturer and political commentator, also blogger um, Rhoda Barrett. Rhoda, just before I get to you, I want to follow through on something Ram Kumar is saying here. I want you to just narrow it down for me. I understand what you're saying. Um, and, and as you have found out, whatever the company says to you, you may want to take that with a pound of salt. So That's whatever correct. they told you in December, yeah, and what they, they, they disclose and so on, is another discussion. What the union, the Steel Workers Union of Trinidad and Tobago, what mechanism, what agreement is there, what uh, safeguard, what safety net is there in place? Absent the company. For uh, everybody is displaced, everybody is fired, everybody is out on their, on, their, on their feet. Was there a safety net set up? Is there a safety net that the members can benefit uh, from, absent what they should be getting from the company? A trade union doesn't provide for employment. We do not employ. Not employment. I not know. employment. Um, I well, mean, any kind of uh, long-term payment benefits, easing down, anything like that. We, there's and there isn't anything. What we have been doing, okay. what we have been doing, mm. is att- attempting to source um, alternate uh, employment in other companies mm. for em- mm. our employees. As a matter of fact, we started doing that early in January, even with the second spate 
actually in early February with the second spate of layoffs. Mm-hmm. There were workers who were absolutely fed up and they st- and companies started coming forward to us and um, we more or less facilitated the process. So we went above and beyond what would have been the norm of a trade union in terms of um, dealing with employees' rights. Mm-hmm. You understand? Mm-hmm. To try and alleviate the problem. 